going to uh, we're going to look at some uh, very old insights into an old age problem that is still very very much with us, and that is um, and as some of you are going to ask why I chose this one for today. Um, there are all sorts of uh, personal and public reasons for choosing this, but um, one of the age old problems of humanity is the evil inclination, the Yetzer Hara. And uh, in this series called Unorthodox Episodes from the Talmud, we could not look at the uh, problems posed by, uh, by certain aspects of unorthodox behavior that involve sexual temptation. The rabbis tell us that uh, the evil inclination has many forms, but very few things are as powerful as the human desire for intimacy, uh, particularly people uh, that they haven't been intimate with before. And that seems to be an age-old problem. And I might add, um, despite the fact that some might argue this, uh, the Talmud regards that uh, particularly as a problem uh, for men. Bearing in mind that men uh, historically have tended to assume roles of spiritual leadership uh, within communities. And the rabbis tell us that, that, that of course, is changing, but historically that's the case. And the rabbis tell us that um, a person's evil inclination is commensurate with their spiritual greatness. So when you see someone who is on a very spiritual level, you should know that they actually are combating uh, an evil urge that uh, has the potential to be greater than anyone else's. And the rabbis are quite transfixed by this idea. Now, the, the, uh, we're going to go to the end of the tractate Kiddushin. Kiddushin is a tractate of the Talmud that deals with marriage for the most part. But at the end of the tractate, it deals with the interesting laws of Yichud. Yichud, as I'm sure you're aware, is the idea that we have a number of halachic uh, restrictions about uh, people of opposite genders, men and women, uh, being in the same secluded space. That's not something that we see explicitly in the Torah, but the Talmud tells us that there's a number of different guidelines we need to follow here because... Uh, the temptation to sexual misbehavior is so strong. And we might think, oh, that's the Talmud patronizing us, tell us that we can't control our sexual urges in perfectly normal situations. Uh, so the Talmud explains to us that many, many great spiritual leaders and rabbis have themselves uh, been tempted by these issues. But in terms of unorthodox episodes, there are some very, very strange episodes brought by the Talmud to prove this towards the end of Tractate Kibushin, there is an entire discussion on just how powerful and dangerous the evil urge is. And I'm going to just pick a couple of these episodes because I think they're not only instructive, but they're also at some level amusing and at some level inspiring. So we're going to start now. We are on, uh, we are on Masechet uh, Kibushin. We're on Pei Aleph Amud Aleph, that is 81A. And uh, the Gemara is telling us about an episode that happened in the town of Nahardea. Nahardea was in Babylonia. It was a very famous rabbinic town, had a huge academy there and a lot of uh, rabbinic students running around, a lot of great rabbis. And it happened that Hanach Shvuyata da Taila Nahardea. There was a, one day a group of young women, uh, young ladies, that had just been redeemed from captivity. It's a very big, important commandment to uh, redeem Jewish people who were taken captive. So this group of young ladies was captured somewhere and then they were brought to Nahardea and they didn't know what to do with them. They didn't know where to put this group of young women. So So they brought these women to the house of Rabbi Amram the pious because they figure, well, you know, of Amram the pious, that's going to be a very safe place to put these women. And Ashkulu Darga Mikamaihu, and they put these women on the upper story of Ravamram the pious's house. They all climbed up to be on the second story, and then they took away the ladder 
so that no one in town would get any ideas of climbing up to these young women. Now, uh, so there's Rav Amram Hasida downstairs and the women are upstairs and there's no way of getting uh, between the two. And not only that, but he's Rabbi Amram the pious. He's one of the great and most pious rabbis in Babylonia. And he's sitting there. As one of these young ladies was walking around upstairs, the light fell, the light of the sun fell through the, uh, came through the skylight as one of these girls was passing by the skylight and he happened to catch a glimpse of her. Then what happened was, Shakre Ravamram Ledarga, Ravamram took hold of the ladder, Delohava Yachlin Be Asara Lamidlaya, a ladder that the Talmud tells us was so heavy that 10 men couldn't carry it. You needed more than 10 men to just lift and move this ladder. Ravamram took hold of the ladder by himself. Dalia Lechude, and he dragged it by himself to where he was able to access the upper story. As the Talmud tells us that the evil inclination is so powerful it can give you superhuman strength. Salik Vyazil, and he started ascending the ladder towards these young women. He couldn't contain himself. Kimata Lapal Gadarga, when he got halfway up the ladder, Ibsach, he suddenly kind of forced himself to stop by kind of locking his legs into the ladder. Ramakala, and he called out in a loud voice, he screamed out, Nura Bayamram, there is a fire at Rav Amram's place. So you can imagine uh, living in ancient Babylonia and there would have been lots of houses near each other. And uh, when someone calls out fire, the the neighbors will gather and they'll come running to try and put out the fire. See, he screams out, there's a fire, there's a fire. After Rabbanan, the rabbis came and they found Rabbanan halfway up the ladder. Amrule, they said to him, Ksiftinan. Now, Ksiftinan has been translated and commentated upon in different ways, this word Ksiftinan. It either means we have shamed you or it means you have shamed us but either way what they're implying is you know we came here and we found you halfway up the ladder what is that telling us about what you were doing but also it's a tremendous embarrassment whether an embarrassment to you or an embarrassment to the rabbis but the general understanding is that you have been found in a compromising position and we have our, our arrival has shamed you Amalohu, he said to them, Mutav tichsafu be'amram ba'al mahaden. It is better that you shame Amram in this world, v'lo tichsafu mine le'al mediate, and that you not be shamed by him in the world to come. Because in the world to come, there are no secrets. Everyone's behavior is... Uh, on a matter of public record, whether private or otherwise. And in the world to come, you would have been greatly ashamed to find out that I had behaved this way. So better you shame me and stopping me from doing this in this world when he had absolutely no other recourse to be saved from his evil inclination. He called out fire, fire. Ash So the Yenafek Mine. So he may he 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 did some kind of uh, spiritual practice where he forced his evil inclination to come out from within him this is very powerful stuff nafak mine he amuda donura and what actually came out of him when he forced his evil inclination out what came out of him was a pillar of fire that stood in front of him uh the evil inclination is represented as a pillar of fire. The Maharsha actually comments on this and says that for that reason, 
Rav Amram wasn't lying when he called out fire, fire. What he actually was doing, he was talking not about any physical fire. Of course, that's what the people who came running thought. But Rav Amram was talking about the fire of the evil inclination that burns inside a person. Uh, the rabbis tell us that the evil inclination is a, a warming effect. One becomes literally on heat. One becomes heated by sexual desire. And we know, in fact, from the commentaries on the, on the Bible, on Tanakh, and this is brought also in commentaries on our Talmud, that if a person is cold, they could actually warm themselves using the Yetzirah, and that uh, Isabel uh, did this with uh, her husband, King Ahav, back in the Book of Kings. She painted all sorts of erotic pictures in his, uh, in his chariot so that he would stay warm uh, during uh, cold periods and so on. It's quite interesting. Um, uh, the Talmud's not telling you that as a way of staying warm in, uh, in the Melbourne winter, but it, it, does, uh, it, it, it does tell you that the uh, Yetzahara, the Eve inclination, is personified as fire. And when he saw this, Amram said, Amale, he said to this caller, he said to the evil inclination, Chazi, I see, Da'at Nura, that you are fire, Wa'ana Bistra, and I am flesh. You are fire and I am flesh. Wa'ana Adifna Minach, and yet I am stronger than you. Rav Amram was able to overcome and to demonstrate that flesh actually is capable of defeating the uh, immense burning flame of the evil inclination. And that is because flesh ultimately comes uh, from a level that uh, represents humility. Uh, because at the end of the day, flesh is flesh. It comes, it goes, uh, it comes from the ground, it goes back to the ground, and therefore it has that level of humility. And humility really, uh, says the Talmud and the commentators, is the only way to... Uh, to overcome the evil inclination. All acts of uh, sexual trespass emerge from a form, a form of uh, desire that is a manifestation at some level of arrogance. But that's a more complicated spiritual level. For now, what we really want to take away from that is that even the greatest rabbis, the greatest spiritual leaders are not immune from the temptations of a sexual desire uh, so next time it happens don't think of yourself as uh, afflicted by something unique but you are part of the great human struggle uh, uh, which is called doing the right thing uh, and 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 uh, a few lines later the, the the Talmud then gives us a few other episodes particularly an interesting one with Rabbi Meir and so on that deal with this idea of sexual temptation but uh, another angle on that is brought in a, a, an episode that Talmud cites a few lines later and I'm on the other side of the page on 81b. And I'm going to talk about that because it's just, it's fascinating and has a number of different aspects to it. These are well-known Talmudic episodes. I'm bringing them up because not everyone knows them and because they drive us a little deeper into understanding this issue. This, this, this story is cute. You're going to like this story if you don't know it. But Rabbi Chia Barashi, there's a great sage in Babylonia called Rabbi Chia Barashi. He's mentioned in a few places, uh, interesting comments that he makes. But he, um, he, he had this habit uh, called Idan the Havenafa Leape. Every time he prayed in the morning, and you know, during the morning prayers, when we finish the Amidah, the standing prayer, we immediately go into what's called Nefilat Apayim, which is the Tachanun, where we. Uh, where we bow our heads in contrition and ask for forgiveness. This is every day after the uh, morning, uh, after the morning Amidah. So uh, he was in the habit that every time he did that, he would say, Have Amar, he would say, May God save us, may God preserve us from the evil inclination. So even though he was one of the great rabbis of the generation, nevertheless, he prayed every day that God would save him from the Yetzirah, from the evil inclination. Yom Achad, one day, Shmatinahu Devetahu, his wife heard him say this. 
Now, it's not the only story in the Talmud which talks about uh, a wife hearing her husband pray or observing her husband's prayer habits. Some of these great rabbis were in the habit of praying at home for whatever reason they weren't going to shul. And uh, maybe it was Corona, whatever. But uh, his wife uh, heard him say this every day. God, please save me from the evil inclination. Please save me from the evil inclination. Amra, Mihdi, she said, I don't, I don't really get this. I don't really know why he's saying this. Hakama Shali de Parish Le Minai. It's been several years since he's, you know, done anything with me. And I'm just assuming that he's kind of like past any sexual urges. Uh, and it's been several years since that's happened. So I don't know what he's talking about. Save me from the evil inclination. I don't know what that means. So she came to the conclusion, and the commentaries fill in the gaps here, that she must have come to the conclusion that uh, she was wrong about thinking that he was beyond that because of old age. And she thought, ah, oh, the reason that he hasn't wanted to do it with me is because, you know, I'm not putting any effort into my appearance. I'm just not interesting enough for him. He obviously has the urge because he's asking God every day to save him from it. So I, I need to put in a bit more effort. So, Kashta Nafsha, she adorned herself. Chalfal Naya Kame. Oh, sorry. Yom Achad. So uh, one day, Havikagaris uh, begin day. He was. Rav, uh, Rav Ghe Barashi was wandering up and down, studying in his garden. So Kashta Nafsha, she adorned herself, Khalfut Naya Kameh, and she went out and paraded herself in front of him in the garden, dressed up all nice and whatever. Now, he didn't recognize her. He didn't recognize her. So Amra, Amala, he said to her, Man At, who are you? Right, he sees this, this beautiful woman, all dolled up in the garden. And he goes, who are you? She said, Ana Haruta. I'm Haruta. Now, Haruta was the name of a famous prostitute in Babylonia. So his wife said that he doesn't recognize her. She says, oh, I'm Haruta. Dahadri Miyoma. And I've, I've come back just for today. And I've got some specials. And I've come back just for today. Tavah, he desired her, he demanded her. He said, I want to hire you. Amrale, so she said to him, Aitinahali lahach romala dresh tzutita. Go and, the Aramaic's gorgeous. Go and grab me that pomegranate on that tree at the highest branch. Go and get that for me. That's what I want. Shavar, so he jumped up, Azal Atya Nahala, and he went and he got the pomegranate and he brought it to her. And that's where the Talmud kind of pauses because uh, uh, it, it, it assumes uh, whatever transpired afterwards. There's different views about whether anything actually transpired. It could be that he came back from the pomegranate tree and he couldn't find her, although. Uh, the implication in the Talmud, and that's what some commentators want to say, but the implication of the Talmud seems to be that he went and got the pomegranate and uh, there ensued what there ensued. Anyway. Um, when he eventually got home, his wife was in the kitchen firing up an oven. The very domestic scene, uh, which we, we, which would support the uh, the view if we're going to break down the narrative episodically, would support the view that perhaps uh, he didn't find her when he got the pomegranate and he just came home. The kayatif salik the kayatif So he got up and he went and he sat in that oven that she was firing up. Amrale, my high. She said to him, what's this all about? What are you doing? Why are you sitting in the oven? So she goes, this is what happened. And he fessed up fully. He goes, you know, I met a prostitute. I met Haruta in the garden. I got her a pomegranate. 
This is what happened. Amrale, Ana Havai. She goes, you idiot. That was me. That was me. Luash Gachba. He didn't believe her. Adiahavale Simane. Until she showed him signs. So some uh, some commentators want to say here that the sign that she showed him was the pomegranate that he brought her. That would make sense. But if that's the case, that means that things actually happen. But whether or not things actually happened or didn't actually happen, um, there was a problem. Because Amala, he said to her, okay, I now believe it was you. Ana Mihali Surai Kuvni. I nevertheless... I, I was intending to do something wrong. It might have actually been you the whole time, but my intent was to sin through sex, through fulfillment of my sexual urges. And it goes on to tell us that all the remaining days of that righteous person he fasted. He fasted every day for the rest of his life at Shemet Bootamita until he actually died from the fasting. This raises uh, numerous issues uh, in relation. Uh, in, in, this story raises numerous issues. One is that there is a whole discussion based on this Talmudic episode about. Uh, uh, in relation to whether it is ever permissible to commit suicide, because it would appear that uh, due to his intense regret, first of all, wanting to sit in the oven, and then secondly, you know, uh, and exercising himself to death, it would appear that he did have some kind of uh, internal death wish for his behavior, for having not having kind of passed the test uh, of, of the sexual urge. Uh, but then there is the whole other issue arising out of this is uh, whether, in fact, the thought of sin equals sin itself. Uh, because uh, we know that uh, Hashem will, combine, will, will actually count the good intentions of a person, even if they don't actually get to fulfill those good intentions, but just by the intention itself is good. But when it comes to bad intentions... Uh, God doesn't count bad intentions unless you actually do it. That's a famous uh, dictum of Chazal. It's a famous uh, dictum of, of, of Jewish uh, spiritual ethics. But in this particular case, Rabbi Chia Barashi regarded himself as having deeply offended uh, his moral code by, even though at the end of the day, what ultimately happened was he ended up having relations with his own wife but because he thought it was someone else it was regarded it was regarded by him as a sin and the general conclusion of uh, the uh, commentaries on this talmudic passage would indicate that, in fact, uh, Rabbi Chia Barashi did do something very, very problematic here, even though he... The Gemara goes on to talk about this idea of what happens if you intend to sin, but you accidentally don't. Uh, in this particular... It's, it's, it's very problematic. There is, a, there is definitely a trespass against the essential uh, moral code. But what, what we actually also see in this story, which is a nice point to end it on, is the idea of, uh, well, for want of a better term, we might call a type of moral karma. And that is that um, he, did, he, wasn't, he wasn't paying attention to his own relationship. His, his own wife was surprised to hear that he still had these urges. And as a result of not paying attention to his own relationship, he was made subject to these kinds of tests in a in a kind of a kosher way he was put into the laboratory of sin and that's what we find very very often we find this in the talmud and we find it in life is that a person is often tested according to their own parameters 
And that's why uh, Jewish spirituality warns us to be very, very careful uh, when we make remarks about what we are or are not capable of doing. I guarantee you, anyone who turns around and says, I would never do that, I would never do that, will at some point in the not too distant future be tested on that by the universe. A person has to be very careful not to set themselves up on some sort of moral platform because you will be tested. Even if you've already been tested, even if you've already been tested and you failed, and then you come back and you say, oh, I failed on that before, the universe will test you again to see whether or not, in fact, you have learnt that lesson. Rabbi Chia Barashi was aware of all of these different levels of Hashgacha Pratit, all of these different levels at which a person and the uni- uh, is accountable to the universe in all so- a myriad of ways. As we constantly come back and we constantly say, Adam mu adle olam, a person, one of the great dicta of the rabbis, a person is always responsible for their behavior. And the person needs to know their limitations. And that is why the laws of Yichud come, because they create a fence around a person. And we know that in today's environment, in today's world, if people were to actually observe the laws of Yichud properly, there would be no Harvey Weinstein, uh, no Me Too movement, all of this, because men and women would respect the dignity of each other and would find and would respect the spaces that they are in. So if a person can avoid situations that could lead to compromise, uh, they will stay safe and in balance with the universe. Uh, Thank you for following me through on these episodes, um, these unorthodox episodes. uh, Four talks on this series seems a little short because there are many, many more issues that I wanted to explore in relation to the apparent unorthodox behavior of many of the rabbis of the Talmud. Every day we find more and more unorthodox uh, behavior. But maybe next week we'll do, uh, next year we'll do another mini series like this and look at more of that. I want to thank Caulfield Shul uh, for the opportunity of having been scholar in residence for this year as well as, of course, uh, 2019. 2020 has been an extremely interesting year for all of us. It's still going, believe it or not. Uh, And it has been my great honor and privilege to have been scholar in residence. We've done many, many uh, programs uh, with Caulfield Shul this year, and they have enabled that. Uh, Thank you to uh, Dimitri, who has edited all of uh, of the Zoom recordings for Caulfield Shul throughout the year. And uh, thank you, of course, to the the, uh, unforgettable and outstanding Marjorie, who is sitting opposite me, who has uh, done all the technological hosting uh, for these events right throughout the year. Uh, and thank you for, to, uh, uh, and, and in many other ways that you can't see, she's, uh, she's really the, the sticky tape of this whole thing. And uh, I want to thank uh, Rabbi Ganendi also for his uh, support throughout the year. And to thank you for joining me and uh, making these little talks uh, so meaningful and uh, uh, pleasurable for all of us. So all the very best. I hope everyone has an amazing summer. Um, and I, I uh, or, or, or in your case, Simon Winter, um, but uh, 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 stay safe is the key word. Uh, don't get caught up in any uh, pandemics or civil wars or anything. And uh, I uh, will also tell you that there is a, uh, I hate plugging, I keep getting handed pieces of paper. Oh, mention this, mention this. Um, I'm currently doing a Jewish history series uh, on Sunday evenings. If you want to know about that, uh, you can, what, davidsolomon.online, davidsolomon.online, is that it? Yeah, is that what it's called? Okay, Uh, you can go there and you can find out uh, more about that. Uh, In the meantime, all the very best, take care, and stay away from sexual temptations is the the last line that I will uh, leave with you. I hope that karma doesn't mean I'm going to end up on the cover of the Australian Jewish News because of that, but I... I, uh, it's, uh, it's worth always behaving in a sense of decorum and balance and respect because it's only by respecting other. And in fact, that was the key message that was given to the world by um, the, uh, the late Rab- Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, whose primary message to the world was that 
it is only by dignity and respect for other that humanity is going to uh, come to its true fulfillment. And uh, may that happen uh, speedily in our days. All the very best. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts, or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon.